Eric Cressy, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. I really appreciate your time. Uh, I imagine you're a very busy man and you were saying even baseball was coming um, it was coming back on, actually. You were saying that to me in the email exchange yeah. that we'd had that baseball is back. So what, what's the what's the world of, of baseball looking like right now um, with post, well, not post-coronavirus, that's for sure, but like yeah. over some it's, sort uh, of hill? <laughs> I'd say it's baseball in spite of coronavirus to the best of uh, their ability. But um, no, the Major League season is uh, is back underway the the season opens up this week um so a lot of teams are just finishing up their last um exhibitions they're calling it spring training 2.0 so it's actually more like summer camp um the major league season is going to happen and then teams have kind of what they call their taxi squads which is kind of like their their backup roster um located somewhere close to their team and then the minor league season unfortunately has, has been you know basically canceled um so a lot of the the development at the younger levels and you know that's been a little bit stunted, which is unfortunate, but um, it'll be good for, for Americans to, to be able to watch some baseball on TV here really soon. And there's lots of crazy testing protocols and meticulous preparations that are taking place to make sure that we can you know, do it safely. But um, so far, so good. So just for the listeners that potentially have not come across you, just explain real quickly um, the roles that you currently have and, and what you kind of do on a day-to-day basis. Sure. Um, so first and foremost, I'm husband and I'm, I'm dad to three girls. So that, uh, that in of itself is a, is a pretty full-time job, but, um, in addition, we, so we own two strength and conditioning facilities, uh, Cressy sports performance. There's a, a facility located in Hudson, Massachusetts, which was our original location that opened in 2007. And then we have a location in Palm beach gardens, Florida. Um, it was originally in Jupiter, Florida, and we just actually built a brand new state of the art facility, um, and moved in this, this past December, um, in Palm beach gardens, which is one town South. Um, so I, I bounced back and forth between the two. I'm in, in Florida about seven and months out of the year. And then in Massachusetts, the other five, um, and then I also serve as director of player health and performance for the New York Yankees. So I kind of had three full-time jobs. Um, but, uh, the way that I structure my year and, you know, have really good people around me, I'm, I'm able to, to bounce around and do a little bit of everything. And, you know, effectively everything we do is, is, is heavily focused on, on the baseball community. Um, overhead athletes are, you know, a population that we, you know, realized was an underserved population. Um, and we, we kind of figured out how to manage them. And you know, I think we've continuously improved in that regard. So we've become a destination for a lot of athletes around the world. And then so a lot of my like speaking, my writing, my consulting, um, you know, kind of falls in that vein as well. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I mean, I've followed your stuff for, for quite a while, but your background is that you were a powerlifter yourself and that mm-hmm. you'd gone into powerlifting. So like, how, how have you, got into how did you really get into this world that you're in and have you amassed sort of the the brand that you've you've got so far and um, where did it begin yeah. sort of what was your first sort of like taste of of training and 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 lifting and and performance based work? yeah so it's kind of a long elaborate whining story i was i was actually a tennis and a soccer player so i often joke that i, I took up powerlifting uh, to convince people that i was actually tough um but basically what happened was i actually left high school thinking i was going to be an accountant um, I was I was very fascinated by the X and O's and had kind of like the entrepreneurial spirit my my high school years and um, my plan was to go to Babson College and to, and to play soccer um, and one of the things that basically happened as I pursued that goal is I, I kind of wound up with an exercise addiction slash eating disorder um, lost a lot of weight my senior in high school and kind of lost out on a chance to play college sports because of it but I still went to school and over those first two years in school as I was you know basically taking on undergraduate management curriculum and taking those classes in marketing and accounting and finance and all that. Um, I began to realize that I was actually a lot more passionate about what I was learning about how my body worked and what I needed to do to get healthy and all that. Um, so after my sophomore year, I, I transferred to the university of new England, um, actually wound up doing a double major in exercise science and sports and fitness management. Um, then I went off to the university of Connecticut for graduate school, um, really, it was kind of one of those, you know, apply to the to the best university you could possibly go to. And at the time, UConn was like the number one ranked kinesiology program in the country several years running. And, um, you know, I just figured if I got in there, then I could figure out my way thereafter. So I wasn't sure if I wanted to go into research, if I wanted to go into biomechanics, uh, even to like pursue physical therapy or clinical exercise physiology. And 
it just so happened when I got to campus, I had the opportunity to, to get involved in varsity strength and conditioning and I immediately fell in love with it. Um, and I was, I was fortunate there to have some really good mentors. I actually did most of my work there in, in basketball and soccer. At one point between 2003 and 2005, we had the four number one teams in the country between our men's, women's basketball and soccer teams all sharing the same weight room. So it was a, an amazing developmental opportunity for me, not just to get mentored by good coaches, but to have the opportunity to to get a lot of reps in with, with good athletes and, and see what coaching cues worked. And um, I learned a lot in that time. And uh, when I left UConn, really went to the private sector and just so happened that some of my first athletes um, were baseball players and, and instantly realized that they were a, a pretty underserved population, you know, where in some cases they would be just given kind of the foo-foo rehab program, you know, here's some bands, don't lift anything heavy. Um, then at the other end of the spectrum, you would have baseball players that were just kind of handed the the clean squat bench program and just treat them like football players and things will all work out. And we realized pretty quickly that, you know, that was a population that, you know, you could push them incredibly hard if you understood what their unique demands were in their sport, what their functional adaptations in place, you know, what kind of structural changes they may have in response to their, you know, their, their sport participation. And I had actually had a lot of shoulder issues myself uh, relating back to my, my tennis career. So a lot of the things that I had learned to take care of my shoulder were things that I could apply because the, the injury mechanism, um, you know, is very similar. So it just so happened that, you know, we started off that, that first year, it was really, it was a one man show in 2006, 2007, we really got going. And, um, it just so happened some of those kids that I worked with that first year, uh, their team won the state championship. One of them won state player of the year. Um, you know, several of them went on to play college sports. And, you know, so immediately my phone started ringing off the hook and, it was kind of a, it was perfect timing because my old business partner from, from Babson College, where I originally went, um, my roommate, or excuse me, he was my roommate. He became my business partner. Um, he had just finished his MBA and was looking for the next step. And I needed a business guy so I could focus on the training. And so we started Cressy Sports Performance in the summer of 2007. And, you know, that was then it was a lot of high school kids. And now we train guys in all 30 major league organizations. Um, you know, we train Cy Young Award winners, MVPs, um, you know, we've, you know, I've close to 200 guys drafted over the last seven or eight years. Um, so it's, it's become kind of this brand um, that has two facilities now and really just came down to like, if you want to start a business, solve a problem. And the problem was that strength addition coaches weren't, you know, giving baseball players the answers that they needed. And we tried to fill that void. Why do you think that was in baseball? I mean, I, I mentioned to you that I've Play professional cricket and this synergy between pitches and and um, and bowling. Obviously, we're not doing it from a standstill position. We we have a run up, but mm -hmm. um, a lot of the stuff that we would get, we would have the odd sort of baseball coach that might come over to the UK and and work with us. But the the probably the story we heard the most coming out of America with with baseball players was the injury rate and the injuries like incredibly so because it is a unique position that you get into and it's obviously unique depending on the individual because of technique the way they've learned all sorts of weird and wonderful things that they go through as they grow up why do you think it was being underserved do you think it was mainly because there was was there a bigger focus on other sports in america yeah well i think not not so much i mean baseball is america's pastime um I think it has a lot more to do with just kind of the old guard of, you know, this is how we've always done it. Um, if you look at baseball, what's interesting about it is players aren't just successful because of athleticism. In many cases, they're successful because of traits or characteristics, right? Maybe it's hand-eye coordination. Maybe it's having long fingers that make you throw a change up better. Um, maybe it's having crazy flexibility that just allows you to contort your body in the, the wild positions of the mound, or maybe you just have a very deceptive delivery or one specific pitch. You know, so there's the old joke. I think it was it was John Crook who said, "We're not we're not athletes. We're baseball players." I think sometimes those perspectives can skew you into thinking as an industry that you know that maybe strength addiction doesn't have that much to offer for you. And what we really saw, you know, was over the course of decades, the average major league player, you know, increased exponentially in size. Pitchers started throwing harder. You know, players started hitting more home runs. Like the the game itself changed. Where now, if you don't participate in those, you get left behind unless you're just an absolute genetic freak. Um, so it's much more accepted than it was probably 25, 30 years ago. Um, but I think also, you know, to some degree, I think as contracts got bigger, there was a greater need for figuring out how do we keep these guys on the field? Like, it, it, you know, it wasn't, you know, long ago that players, you know, they'd play in the season, then they'd have to work off season jobs to make ends meet. And, you know, nowadays it's, it's obviously markedly different where, you know, the salaries are 
have, have gone up exponentially. But um, you know, you have to have support staff to to basically try to keep those investments on the field. Um, you know, and certainly there's a trickle down effect to that, right? Is as more and more money gets involved, more and more popularity you know, escalates then you have more and more high school kids that want college scholarship. You have more and more college kids that are selling out for the dream because they want to get drafted. So there's, there's a strong feeder program in place. And, um, you know, major league baseball is, you know, it's, it's they're, you know, the revenues are, you know, peaking each year. So, um, you know, that speaks to the popularity of the game and the grand scheme of things, even if attendance is down a little bit um, in the last couple of years, obviously prior to the pandemic, um, you know, baseball is a, is a thriving industry um and i think you know it's that that's a testament to the importance of what we do we need to keep these guys on the field so that they can actually go out and continue to grow the game for the future generations yeah it's a good point that then beating commodities um how do you but that's a real interesting point you brought up about that almost the skill versus um mm-hmm. the physical attributes that you have because the, the the game is based on your ability to get strikeouts to hit home runs to to do the skill um, it's not like a hundred meter run where it's the the best sort of well again genetics will come down to it but you you're working physically and your phys- the best physical performer will win on the race day it's it, it's again in our sport you're judged on your skill how do you manage players who potentially I don't know don't buy into the that will have an incredible skill level there, there's an element of their skill level that is undoubtedly going to get them on the field because they may be like mm. you said they may have attributes that are just better and genetic freaks and different to others yeah how, how do you kind of convince them with that buy-in for strength and conditioning that's gonna well it's proven to to improve their lack of well injury rates their performance yeah. and everything how do you how do you work around that yeah I mean, I think the first thing is that you you own your lack of success, right? I'm a big believer in extreme ownership. If if a player doesn't buy into what I'm selling, then I'm not a good salesman. I haven't articulated my perspective effectively. And, and probably more importantly, I haven't done a good enough job of involving him in the process to giving him an ownership role in his training to, to provide feedback on what's worked, what hasn't, so that we can work together to pull together a program that's going to work well for him. And, and, and that's something that, that we did, I think, extremely well as we, we came in and, you know, kind of changed the focus of some of the things that were going on with the Yankees when I, I started up this past year. But, um, you know, that's something that I think we've, we've built our entire business and private sector on is giving athletes an ownership role. But I, I think one of the things that's, that's, you know, incredibly powerful that we've always been able to do in the private sector is leverage our previous successes, right? So if, you know, if we have a 16 year old kid that wants to throw year round, I can walk him across the room and, and introduce him to a big leaguer who, you know, took three months off per year, played a different sport, you know, did something differently and had success doing it. So we can at least generate a really quick sample size for him to say, Hey, this has worked for other athletes right now. Like I know this is what you want to do. It's probably not in your best interest. If you decide you want to go that route, let's talk about how we can make it work sustainably. But um, you know, I think anytime you can leverage previous successes, that's really, really helpful. And, and that's easy for me to say, right? Because I can, I can walk across the room and do that. It's a lot harder for a younger coach to do that. So you're going to have to take different avenues. But I, I always come back to like, it, you start with a, with a shared goals discussion, right? So if, you know, not to get political, but if, if you and I were, you know, at completely opposite ends of the political spectrum, right? We're probably going to butt heads if we just argue about, you know, point count or point count you know, things like that. But if we both agree that our goal is to make X better and Y better, if we understand what the actual goal is, it immediately becomes a much more productive conversation, right? If I say, you know what, some of the stuff on my side, like that's way too extreme. I would never do that. And you say, hey, some of the stuff on our end, like we, we push that too far. We're not going to do that. And you have like this perspective about not being extremist. You can all of a sudden find a really, really appropriate way to meet in the middle. And I think you have to do that with all of your athletes. So th- this is going into probably a big part of the conversation I was looking forward to talking about which is your overall sort of view on athlete development yes there is there is undoubtedly the the metrics and the specific techniques and exercises that we can you can delve into yet how much of your work is is I've seen a lot of your posts that you've put up around more how you coach than sort of Mm -hmm. what you coach what is your if you get a young athlete well actually even if it's a, a pro athlete that's midway through their career what is your way in which you manage them as a whole both physically mentally even emotionally as a holistic approach to an athlete what is your um, style and view on on that 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a broad question. It's, it's a little yeah. bit of a tricky one to answer. What I would say yeah. is where, where I think we've had a lot of success is, is not leaving any stone uh, unturned. You know, I mean, we, if you walk into our facility, every athlete that's in there has been assessed by one of our coaches. You know, that's a conversation. That's a review of a health history. That's a discussion about training backgrounds and goals, um, you know, and, and good and bad experiences in the gym. And then it's a, it's a movement assessment. You know, it's obviously a, a collection of both general and specific tests, you know, classic orthopedic range of motion stuff and more functional tasks, you know, things that are more general movement screens and then also things that are specific. And there's also usually a skill development aspect that particularly in our baseball world, like, you know, we're going to look at, you know, video of them throwing, we're going to look at metrics on, you know, what spin rate, spin efficiency, spin access, things they do to a baseball. Um, you know, we're going to talk about what the things they want to be able to do that they can't do are. Um, so all those things are just trying to give us a picture of what we need to do to help an athlete. And then, you know, the programs are written up in accordance with those. And then, you know, we, we obviously are going to coach them, you know, in a way that's, that's ideal for them. Right. So you have athletes that are more visual than kinesthetic or, or auditory learners or whatever it may be. So you're always just trying to find that right mix, not only to put the right program on a piece of paper, but to also relate to them. Here's what we don't do. You're not going to walk in the facility and see one program on the dry erase board um, because how you treat somebody with a wide infrasternal angle is going to be markedly different than how you teach somebody with a, a, a narrow infrasternal angle, right? You know, if you see somebody who's crazy hypermobile and somebody who's very, very stiff, they need different things. They need different exercises. They need different coaching cues. And it, it sounds crazy to say, but that's actually been a remarkably differentiating factor for us. You'd be shocked at, you know, how many high level training facilities and organizations just kind of give everybody the same thing. And, and the second, you know, you, you start individualizing, you start making athletes care, realize that you, you actually care about them, that you, you view them as a unique individual that has, you know, individual goals and you know, specific needs and things like that. So I, I think for us, it's always been about trying to treat each person, you know, uniquely. And I think that that also, to be honest, kind of plays into, um, you know, if you're familiar with like some of Chip and Dan Heath's writings, they wrote a book called The Power of Moments. And, and we know an athlete like that. We know them, we know their family, we know their kids' names, we know what kind of pitches they throw, we know their training background, all that stuff. Like it, it puts us in a better position to, to nurture a relationship and, and make them excited about coming to the facility where that, that place is, you know, maybe there's home and then there's work or school and then we're that third place. Like that's what we want them to feel like. So I think all these things are additive and, and the relationship always just gets strengthened and the, and the coaching proficiency gets better and better when you really get to know the person. Yeah. Do you think with the sort of flip side of that other organization outlook on, on one size fits all, do you think that's potentially down to the fitness industry and the sport and performance industry trying to churn out a lot of people and, and potentially focusing on quantity rather than the quality? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's certainly the case. And, and I think, um, you know, one of the things I, I said to my business partner when we first went into to business, and I still stick to it, was I never want our business model to dictate our training model. I always wanted our training model to dictate our business model. I want to be able to deliver, deliver a premium product where we individualize. I wanted to have, you know, training equipment that was going to be catered towards baseball players' needs. I wanted safety squat bars and stuff along those lines that, that I thought would be utilized in the population that we had. But I never wanted to feel like our business model wasn't flexible enough for us to provide a, you know, legitimately quality service for our for our clients. And, and that's something we've adhered to for, for 13 plus years now. And I, I think it's really served us well, you know, and, and, and certainly the, the corollary to that is there are facilities that do well with, you know, one size fits all programs on the dry erase board that can, that can work. You know, it's obviously open to the skill of the coach and their ability to, to kind of pivot when you see someone who's, you know, under loaded or overloaded with the, the complexity of those exercises where, you know, all of a sudden a front squat doesn't look good. Maybe you're going to go to a reverse lunge or you're going to do a goblet squat or something like that. Being able to pivot in that regard, I think is really important for the success of those programs. But in many cases, they're successful for other reasons, right? So maybe the exercise selection and the coaching isn't perfect. But maybe the fact that they schedule things that way creates way more camaraderie in their facility. So they're, they're more likely to improve exercise adherence and people are going to attend 99% of their sessions instead of, you know, attending 7% of them. You know, get me somebody who shows up consistently, even if the program's not perfect, I'm probably going to feel better about that. So, I, you know, I think people like to rip on CrossFit and things like that. I actually think there are, you know, tons of things that we can learn from CrossFit. 
you know, and that we can borrow just like any other discipline. We can borrow things from physical therapy can use. We can borrow things from the powerlifting world. All these different op, um, opportunities to learn are out there from open mind enough to, to actually you know, take a look at them. Yeah. Um, you kind of touched on when you're, um, de- obviously you're developing someone individually. If you're looking, to, there must be a balance between, and I've, I've experienced this before where you're trying to get as an athlete, you're trying to gain something you're trying to work on a new i don't know phys- it might be a physical goal of maybe not necessarily lifting more but it could be i think one of the common ones you'll get is increased speed of pitching so you're trying to that might be your outcome that you're looking to get and is there sometimes a way in which you're you're striving for a gain but can also have the detriment to your skill is there a balance that you have to yeah. find sometimes in, in your work there yeah, I mean, I think you know, anytime you add, you're going to have to take something else away. I think that's something that we've recognized over the course of time. Um, you know, in, in baseball, right, if we want to up our throwing volume, we probably can't up our med ball volume at the same time, right? Rotation is rotation. You know, that's some kind of like efficiency, but um, or some kind of like a, you know, a way to overload volume if you're not careful, not efficiency. But, um, you know, I, I think with that said, there are scenarios where training can interfere with skill development, no doubt about it, right? Whether that's from an acute fatigue standpoint or whether it's because of, you know, just aberrant patterns. And, you know, a good example, like Stuart McGill has actually talked about this with respect to, you know, if you look at a lot of elite rotational sport athletes, they actually have spines that are, you know, they have, they have smaller intervertebral discs. They're, they're spines that are much more conditioned to, you know, to bending and rotating. Um, conversely, you look at like an NFL player's spine, you know, it's, it's obviously they're, they're big old vertebrae. They got bigger discs, you know, they handle compression really well because they've got to get used to running into people. Um, you know, if you, if you train a really pliable rotational driven spine, you know, like a power lifter, it's probably not going to work out well, right? You, they may actually have more problems and, you know, you take away some of what makes them successful. So our training always has to support our skill development work and, and, and not get in the way of it. Yeah. They, is it? I think I've seen sometimes where that's gone the other way and it and it's you you've seen someone potentially like work on the physical side and then the skill and then you lose sight of actually that's what your bread and butter is and that's what you've been that's what you've been paid for. Um mm-hmm. a lot of your stuff that I see is able to take the complex of the world that you live in it's very very that you can get into some real um articulate wording you can go into some heavy metrics but when it comes down to being an athlete, having been on that side, it's like, I just want to be told what you need me to do. Sometimes you might, I, I was someone who wanted to know why. I wanted to know why, how, mm-hmm. what, what it is. Um, and ha- is there a way in which you try to take this complex work and, and keep it simple? And, and is it obviously done on a person to person basis? Yeah, that's actually something I've had to learn. Um, you know, to be honest, one of the biggest mistakes I made early in my coaching career is I talked too much. You know, I'm, I'm a guy, I'm born in the Northeast U.S. And what we know about Northeast U.S. people, we tend to go fast. We tend to mutter. Um, you know, it's just kind of the nature of, of how I've been. So I've, I've had to slow myself down, you know, and, and I, always, I always reiterate this to our interns and new coaches that, you know, you want to be clear, you want to be concise, and you want to be firm, you know, particularly when you're coaching in a semi-private environment. Obviously, personal training is going to be a lot more, you know, conversational at times and, and things like that. But when you're, when you're working with a group of athletes, you want to, Get in, get out, like be, be really concise with your cues. And so you have to choose your words carefully. Um, so I think that's something that's, that, that's super important. And, and also understand that, you know, sometimes it's not even a word, right? You know, if I can teach a guy to, to tuck his chin from 40 yards away just by doing this, right? Um, you know, you can, you can emphasize things with body language too. And that's particularly important now, honestly, in like a pandemic where, you know, we can't get too close to people and use our hands to reposition them and things like that. So, um, you know, certainly I've I've gotten more efficient, I think in that regard, but, you know, another thing that, you know, Nick Winkleman's spoken about a lot is just the power of analogy, um, you know, external focus cues, those, those tend to obviously help a ton with, um, respecting yet, you know, kind of find the context that an athlete already has. So we use those uh, quite a bit, you know, obviously use the environment around them and then analogies just to relate it to something that, you know, is similar. Just like anytime I, uh, you know, I, I talk about like, you know, using a counterbalance on a weight, I, I say, it's just like moving the fat kid to the end of the seesaw. Right. <laughs> so you know, it kind of puts things into perspective. Like yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But there, there's a bunch of different things that you can do in that regard. And, and all of a sudden, you know, it's a humorous moment in some cases, but it's also something that usually registers with the athlete. You're obviously 
renowned now as one of the world's leaders in SNC, and I imagine a lot of people are, are coming to you. Um, have you? Did you ever go through sort of imposter syndrome as you were coming up through the the world of strength and conditioning? You know, it's it's to be honest, uh, I I think I probably did, but I didn't recognize what it was in the in the moment. Um, probably earlier in my career, um, you know, I th I think a lot of that stuff happens when you when you pay too much attention to the noise out there, and eventually it can kind of become subconscious that you're you're acquiring it, and you're taking it in. Um, you know, I I want to say it was probably around two thousand. Six two thousand seven. I just kind of made a conscious decision to stay off internet forums. You know, I, I just I had no no interest in arguing with people on social media or anything like that. I I realized that you know if I wanted to do what I wanted to do in this world, there was no time to argue on the internet. Um, you know, in in various capacities, there's no time to argue. Period. Um, you know, I just especially nowadays, like there's there's some good stuff. Trevor Moad was just on my podcast and and he talked about it. Listen to a, to a great book that, that just talks about how, like. Like social media doesn't change people's mind. People go there for confirmation bias. So if you just sit there and yell all day, all you do is waste time. And it's you know even more prevalent for me now that I have, I have kids. Like I have no desire to argue on the internet. But in, in pushing that out, I pushed out a lot of the negativity I think that could have driven some of the imposter syndrome. But but more importantly, it, it freed up a lot of time for me to, you know, to study, to learn, to shadow really good coaches and therapists. Um, you know, experiment with our athletes to, to build relationships with a lot of the athletes that I think were really impactful and in, in growing our build our businesses over the course of time. And it also gave me an opportunity to be a producer and not just a consumer um, early in my career. And you know, I've been writing in some capacity every single day for, you know, over 17 years now. Um, it was just something that I did. Um, and you realize that there's a huge body of work there and, you know, kind of you know, develop this, this accidental career doing it um, just because I did it so much. So, you know, if, if there's anybody out there listening, I think that's the first place you start, you know, you just try to build relationships and you're not going to do that arguing on the internet. Um, you know, for me, my online presence is very much about helping people. I want to put good information out there. I want to introduce products that I think can be impactful for, you know, helping end users or educating fitness professionals. Um, you know, I want to have conversations like these where I feel like, you know, some of this information might register with a, a 22 year old coach out there that was, you know, maybe struggling with some of the same stuff that I was struggling with when I was just getting to grad school. Yeah, for sure. I think that's the the world of health and sports performance and fitness is, is just full of people that just want to be right all the time. They just want to constantly be, be sh showing what they know. And, and again, that yeah. manifests itself in over complicating it, over communicating stuff. I'm, I'm always yeah. a big believer. Yeah, the, I think, Go on. I don't mean to cut you off. One of the things I was going to say is you mentioned imposter syndrome. It's, you know, that that speaks to, uh, you know, like people feeling inadequate, right? Because they compare themselves to, to what they think the norm is. I think one of the best ways around that is to actually go out and understand what the norm really is. And, and we, to be honest, realized in 2008, 2009, 2010, we were first getting going, like there was really nothing good out there for these players to turn to. Like it was very, very limited in terms of resource in the baseball community. Like we, we kind of created the industry of baseball specific strength and conditioning. So when you're to some degree, like this, this first mover advantage, you're like first to market, like it immediately throws out this concept of imposter syndrome. But what I would tell you is if you're people that are listening to this, like the number one thing that they can do to help their cause, go understand the status quo, go out and see what's out there, observe other gyms, travel and check out facilities that you know, you, you, you admire and, and try to learn from them, but you also might in the process just realize that they're not everything that they're cut out to be. Um, and, and for us, that was kind of the case early on. And we realized that, you know, we, we could compete with the big dogs. So it was, it was extra fulfilling in that regard. Yeah. That's, um, that's, that's great information. I think for, for coaches and anyone who potentially is either training people or being trained themselves, that's, um, super valuable. I actually wanted to talk about a little bit in some of the stuff that you potentially use with your athletes as a bit more of a staple, um, actually around things like recovery. So obviously uh, it can be very easy to get caught up in overtraining. You even mentioned about you having your own exercise addiction. How did that hmm. manifest itself? Yeah, for sure. So I was, uh, you know, I was kind of the, the chunky kid growing up. Um, you know, I, I, I shopped in the Husky section and, um, you know, just one of those athletes that, you know, for me was, um, you know, I, I wasn't fast enough, right. I had, I had pretty good skills both in soccer and in tennis, but I realized that the next you know level for me was going to be able to, you know, 
run faster, jump higher, change directions quicker. You know, the next level is obviously going to be competitive in that regard. And, you know, I think it's one of those things where you don't you know, necessarily set out to, to have it become such a challenge. But, you know, for me, I'm a very type A personality. And when I decided I wanted to, to lean out and start lifting and conditioning harder and eating better and all this stuff, you just kind of keep pushing the bar higher and higher. And you realize that some people are, you know, are certainly uh, predisposed to that. You know, like there's there's some pretty good research out there that shows that you know basically uh, eating disorders do have a, a genetic component. So there's a couple instances of it in my family before me. Um, so it was always intriguing, and I, I never felt like I had you know false pressure put on me or anything like that. But you know, it was one of those things where I just kind of kept pushing and pushing, and before I knew it, I you know lost 80 pounds and made myself really sick, and you know had gone the the pendulum had gone the exact opposite direction. And, you know, to be honest, that's a it's an interesting dialogue because I, there are several other people who are kind of like in my position in the industry who went through some of the same stuff. Um, Brett Bar- Bartholomew was really really upfront about that, and in his book, he talked about some of the stuff he realized. And you know, it, in both cases, like it kind of helped us find our careers. So we've had some some good conversations about some of that stuff. Did you know it was when it was actually happening? Did were you kind of aware of it, or did you it just yeah. a reflect a reflective thing? Yeah. No, I, I, I think I was, you know, certainly not to the, to the extent I probably needed to, to come out of it a lot sooner, but I think, you know, when you, when you look at something like that, you know, I, I've always viewed, and, and again, this is personal opinion and it's, you know, I look back on my cases and, and I always looked at, you know, eating disorders as, as a form of excessive convulsive disorders, right? You tried to find control wherever you could, you know, and, and for some people it was because they, you know, they lacked control in other aspects of their life. You had people who were alcoholics who had eating disorders, you had people who had, you know, been in domestic violence situations, you know, uh, you know, athletes who, who had circumstances that were outside their control with respect to, either their sport participation their career success or even their body image. You know, for me, I always look back on it. I I was a confused athlete. I just needed direction. Um, And I I never felt like I could go anybody with direction. It was, you know, it's kind of like that era where it was like the, the low fat craze, you know, kind of trending the zone. Like there were so many different perspectives about sports nutrition. And I just, you know, I I don't, I don't fault like my parents at all. My mom was a, you know, a school, a a high school teacher. And my mom was a, my dad was a school bus distributor. So it's like, they weren't equipped to give me nutritional education. And to be honest, I struggled to kind of find my way out of it. And it wasn't until actually I I was introduced to a, you know, competitive bodybuilder from my hometown who kind of took me under his wing and, you know, taught me about proper nutrition, got me training in a better way. And actually gave me my first opportunity working at his gym. I worked the front desk on, on Saturday mornings as a way to like get my foot in the door in the industry. His name is Daryl Cohen. He still owns a gym in my, my hometown in Maine. And, you know, I look back and, you know, I, I was a guy who just needed a mentor, you know, and, and it was life changing for me, you know, probably saved my life in a lot of ways. So, um, you know, I, I think you got to be really careful about lumping all these things into the, the same diagnosis. Cause you know, what worked for me obviously wouldn't necessarily work for, for a lot of other people. You mentioned uh, b- body image there, especially for for men. I think it's something that's un- not spoken about too much, and especially in the world of of performance and, and health and fitness, it's. Um, it, do you see it sometimes getting in the way of people performing, maybe potentially training to look a certain way rather than losing sight of actually the the performance outcome goals, or is your entire industry you, what the work you do shifted away from? from that um i think i think you certainly see it you know i think you see baseball players that you know maybe try to look good you know and at the end of the day they lose sight of the fact that it's it's much more about performing well um you know but i I think those conversations are relatively easy to have at the at the level i'm I'm at right now and Mm. um i don't think they you know they have to be mutually exclusive goals like you can you can train very hard for sport participation and look perfectly you know perfectly fine as long as you you know you take in quality calories and things like that so um you know i don't think it's that much of an issue i you know i I wrote a book about it so you can you can have the show and you can have the go too so that's not something i I lose sleep over right now i don't think it's one of my my, i guess my big challenges in my career as Mm. as it is but you know i can certainly see it being a challenge for other coaches in certain plays particularly you know those who deal with more female athletes than i do yeah yeah good point good point um so yeah wanting to get on to talking about the ways in which you sort of the stuff around training. So what, is there anything you use as a kind of go-to recovery um, method for, for your athletes after all the training that they're going through? Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I think for, for starters, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of icing. You know, if, if there's an athlete who, who, you know, is a diehard icer, you know, I'm, I'm going to pick my battles. I'm not going to go right at him and tell him that's a terrible idea to do, do to do that. But um, you know, for me, I've, I've always been a, a, you know, a big fan of active recovery. 
Um, so in that regard, you know, like, you know, certainly at the lowest level, something like a Mark Pro, um, something a lot of our athletes use um, just because you get the, the muscular recruitment without necessarily all the effort. So it's good for, you know, guys to wear on planes when they're traveling or, you know, we have guys that wear it to bed, particularly after acute injuries, anything like that. It can, can help you to kind of expedite the process. And I actually had a really good podcast with Gary Ryanel, um at Mark Pro all about, you know, where the icing myth originated sports medicine. So I don't, I don't use it, um, you know, in, in a recovery scenario, I certainly don't recommend it, but, um, I love like low key mobility circuits, light activity, anything like that. Um, all good. Um, big fan of manual therapy, you know, a variety of different disciplines. Some athletes like instrument assisted stuff, you know, cupping Graston, some people like ART, some people like dry needling others, you know, like, something more aggressive like fascial manipulation or you know rolfing but um you know just in general i think there's a there's a ton of merit we don't necessarily know exactly why manual therapy works but it does seem to help um, a lot of athletes rebound um you know certainly like foam rolling lacrosse ball theragun stuff like that can can be helpful for some athletes as well it's a kind of different approach to manual therapy um you know and then certainly you can get sexier and sexier with it if you have access to things like you know, hyperbaric chambers and, you know, some people like contrast baths. Um, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, I think you got to find what works best for you. Yeah. And especially that, I think that was a period I went through on my own sort of performance journey that you, you have to try everything to begin with. I found out very mm -hmm. quickly that something like cupping didn't work for me. Just, I just r responded really bad to it, but dry needling, that was beautiful. I could have a good session from that and come out of it. Active recovery, yep. things like yoga, mobility for me, absolutely ideal. Um, for other people, completely different. So I always recommend just try as much as you possibly can to um, to to find out what works for you. Um, and as regards to nutrition, is there something you, you, you work, whether it's a, I guess everyone's goals are different, but is there a staple sort of way in which you work around nutrition for yourself what yourself and professionally um yeah i mean my own, i'll speak to my personal one and or actually i'll speak to the professional aspect of it so i'm <laughs> fortunate we have great nutrition people at, at both of our facilities um who handle a lot of our inquiries there you know like I, I know what i don't know and i certainly don't have the time to, to take that on so we have, we have some good people at our facilities who can take the lead on those um with that said you know those guys refer out you know so anytime there's something that's more clinical in nature um, you know, obviously we, we, we reach out to some folks who are, who are able to handle that, but, um, you know, personally for me, I'm, I'm very much like a meat and vegetables guy. Um, I don't eat a ton of carbs just because my, my training volume is not necessarily as high as it, it used to be. So, um, for me, I'm, I'm definitely kind of like meat and vegetables for the majority of the time, maybe, a, you know, I'm not, I'm not like a big potatoes or rice or, or anything like that. Um, and I'm, I'm lucky. I actually don't have a, a sweet tooth really at all. So I'd, I'd much rather have a good steak than like ice cream or something like that. Um, my wife is in the next room, probably rolling her eyes at me right now. But, um, <laughs> it's just, just kind of the way I'm made. Yeah, that's, that's fair enough. And, um, what is there, if you could, if you could pick a bit of kit that you like using the most in your, in your work, is there, is there something that, or if there was an athlete out there that you would recommend the best bit of kit to either first start working in their strength training, um, or even specific, uh, moves to, to work on. Um, you said it's like a specific kit. Sorry, you cut out a little yeah, bit like, you asked the question. It, is there um, a specific bit of, of kit, like equipment that you have a go-to in your performance um, center that, that you that you think is like the most staple thing you have? Or is it really oh, that's a, broad? That's a great question. No, I mean, we'll, we'll throw the kitchen sink at it. I mean, we'll use kettlebells, barbells, dumbbells, a ton of stuff on like the functional trainer with the cables. Um, no, I, I try not to, to limit myself in that regard. Certainly, I think we had to be a little bit... Um, you know, maybe more, uh, more, more creative during the pandemic when folks were, were working out at home. I had guys yeah. doing full workouts with like backpacks full of soup cans. We had big guys that were front squatting their girlfriends. We, we were doing whatever it took. So, <laughs> you know, I, I definitely, uh, I, after going, going back to the gym after, after dealing with that for a month or so was, you know, it, it was like a, an embarrassment of riches when you walked in there and saw a full dumbbell rack and, you know, plates and barbells. So, um, no, I, I try not to limit myself too much from an exercise standpoint. I, you know, if, 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 if it's out there, we, we're open to using it. If we if you feel like it, uh, it provides some benefit. Yeah. I really like your approach it is, it is so unique to the individual that you're working with, which I think is just, if anything, if anyone's getting anything out of this so far is, is really about that, that individualism on the, the person you're working with yeah. and, and you ask the person that is doing your training, 
it, it is so much about experimenting. I think even what you said about your your own personal journey in in coaching is that you learned probably so much from just doing, just act and do and learn on the job. And that's where, if there's any common dominator I see in coaching and athletes, is is just learning by doing. Um, that's it. it is there is there i'm very cautious of time i don't want to take up too much of your time as it's late where you are uh probably the last thing i wanted to talk about was is there sort of common traits you see with the high performers you've worked with so many people in a broad spectrum of of sports as well throughout your career um is there something that you would say is like a common trait whether it's both not necessarily physical but also sort of their whole approach to their game their whole approach to their training that you think is a common trait that is there for high high performers yeah and i'm gonna qualify your question when we say sustainably high performers right yeah, there are a lot okay. of guys yeah. who are you know flash flashes in the pan who don't who don't necessarily stick around for a long time um I, i've been fortunate to work with some guys who have, who have put in a lot of you know a lot of time at the at the highest level and and, and learned a lot from it and i've asked just a lot of questions um, I, I think, you know, two things that jump out at me and they're less physical in nature because to me, big leaguers come in all shapes and sizes and there's different ways to be successful. I'd say that the things that I notice about them, one, they tune out distractions incredibly well. Um, you know, they're guys that aren't checking their cell phone between sets. You know, it goes in the cubby, they go and they train and then they go on with their life. Like, so they, they, they definitely shut that aspect of the world off really well. Um, so I think that's one that I've noticed for some of our guys who have, who have been sustainable high performers for a long time. Um, and then the second one is just adaptability. They, they recognize that what worked for them at, at 23 or 27 might not work for them at 33 or 35 or whatever it is. So the ability to adjust programs um, over the course of time to, to acquire, you know, information from experts and, you know, and really solicit feedback from others, I think is a way that they make themselves continuously better. Um, and and it, cause you have to adjust. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm 39 years old. Like I can still do a lot of the dumb stuff I did when I was 29. I just can't bounce back, back from it nearly as quickly as I used to. So, you know, I, I think, you know, being mindful of that is, is something where they're, you know, they're differentiated for sure. I think I also heard you say in a podcast as well about that you you tend to work with athletes that you know are motivated. If you if that motivation isn't there, then you tend to not be be working with them. How does how does that sort of motivation manifest itself? And do you even think that motivate? What is your uh, way in which you think that their motivation can either be boosted, or is there a way in which you think people can get motivation yeah. out of themselves in what you've seen? Yeah, I mean it's a it's it's a complex topic. There's no doubt it, about it. it. Is, I would say that yeah. one of the, one of the things that we're fortunate with is that we've had a fair amount of success in our industry um, with our facility. And to some degree, it puts a little bit of a velvet rope around our facility, where you know we we don't get a whole lot of athletes that, that travel you know from far away to train with us if they aren't inherently motivated to to not just you know to show up, but also to to listen to us and leverage our expertise. Like, you know, you'd think that we're in, you know, beautiful Florida that they're just going to like pop in and, you know, do it for the weather or something like that. In reality, they, they do it because they want to get after it because we have a lot of expertise that, you know, they know can help them. So you know, I really don't feel like I have a lot of athletes that, that aren't great workers. Um, that it just doesn't happen very often. And maybe it's because we're dealing with a lot of guys at the highest level where, you know, if they had acted like that, they wouldn't have gotten there. Um, but I, I do think that that one of the things that we do from a motivation standpoint is like, I, I do think there's a standard of excellence that we, we try to uphold. Um, you know, and that's 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 multifaceted, right? That's our coaches continuing to get better, to you know, to pay attention to detail in their coaching, to go out to continuing education events, and to constantly adapt our programs. Like I think athletes recognize it when they see their coaches working hard for them, and you know, I think that's something we've always done well, and I think it's a it's a, it's a motivating factor. Um, so that you know, I'd, I would say is is certainly one thing that we can do. But I think the other thing is just the facility tone often creates the motivation. You know, you want your facility to be that third place that I talked about earlier. So, you know, who wants to go into an energetic, upbeat facility and just have a crappy workout? Like you don't, you walk in there, your buddies are getting after it, the music is bumping, there's energy, all that. You wanna create that environment um, because the facility should be the, the motivating factor, you know, because very few athletes are intrinsically self-motivated. Like there, there are some out there, um, but they're, they're few and far between. You're much better off, you know, not trying to change the person, but rather, you know, change the situation, put them in an environment where they can be successful and, and good things tend to happen. 
yeah i love that controlling the environment creating an environment they want to they want to be at that's um that's mm-hmm. awesome look um yep. i've i've absolutely loved this this chat um is where's the best place for people to find you the the channels <laughs> that you find i know there's some amazing stuff that you put yeah. out on youtube um but where's yeah. the best place for people to find you yeah, they're in a few different spots. So social media is um, both Twitter and Instagram or at Eric Cressy. Um, my website is ericcressy.com. We have a, a free newsletter, free blog. Um, there's also a free podcast that's more in the baseball niche, but we have you know a lot of folks from the sports science community and skill development worlds and things like that. And like you mentioned, YouTube, it's uh, youtube.com backslash ecressy. Um, so we're, we're always throwing new content up on those. So um, should they check them out if you're interested. Yeah, there's some awesome resources out there for both coaches and athletes. Eric, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And um, you got it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having being on here. Thank, thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed the conversation. Cheers.